the hardest thing to do in this world by far is to let go of what you love, whether that be people, places, or third P word. This is a lesson that the team behind Amphibia not only understood, but made it a three-year mission to teach to others. And it all came to an end with a conclusion that moved the hearts of many, jam-packed with so many details, that makes this a celebration and huge love letter to Amphibia as a whole. Strap yourselves in, because this is our ultimate breakdown of the Amphibia series finale, The Hardest Thing, which we hope will give you a much deeper appreciation for the finale as a whole. It's been an honor covering Amphibia for these last three years. So many people have been telling me recently that they only started watching because of our videos and our hype around the show. I'm flattered that so many people valued my opinion that much, truly. And if you want to stay in the loop with the future of animation alongside our post Amphibia content, as I have plenty of video ideas for the series still, then be sure to subscribe to the roundtable with notifications on so you never miss a video. And be sure to check out Toon Drip and our Amphibia inspired 3 stars tarot card design. I know it's not exactly show accurate, as I've said before, that was a risk we knew we were gonna take, but the art is just so, so good that I think it's very much still worth picking up. Link to Toon Drip in the description below. With all that said, let's dive in one last time. Picking up directly from All In, we return to Amphibia after some intense showdowns on Earth, such as Anne vs. Andreas and Sasha vs. Darcy. Whereas the end of the last episode depicted Amphibia at night, a bulk of this finale takes place at dawn. Sunrises are often symbolic of hope, rebirth, and even resurrection, which all play a role in this finale. The girls are the last hope of Amphibia, fighting for not only its survival, but for a new era to be ushered into this world, accumulating into the sacrifice and revival of Anne Boonchoy. Viewing the final moments of All In from the perspective of the core, we see the helmet blast off into space and plant itself onto the moon, activating its final protocol by smashing the moon directly into Amphibia's surface, destroying the planet Majora's Mask style. My favorite Zelda game, which revolves around Link preventing the destruction of a parallel world after the titular Majora's Mask, influences Skull Kid and sets the moon on a collision course towards Earth. In a blink and you miss a detail, while Anne, Sasha, Marcy, and their allies arrive to the outskirts of Utopia with the aid of Domino 2 and Joe Sparrow, Andreas actually lands on his feet thanks to the help of Frobo. Keep in mind, Andreas smashed Frobo into pieces, reducing him to a robot head on wheels for quite some time. Despite this, Frobo recognizes the rough state Andreas is in after his battle with Anne and goes out of his way to help him move around. Just goes to show that Frobo is a true planter, showing kindness to even those who have wronged him. Marcy claims that the core fears are relevancy more than anything else, opting to destroy the civilization the mines within built from the ground up, simply so it can have the last laugh and reclaim the stones as its prized possession. Mother Oma rises to the scene and believes that the prophecy has come to pass, but clarifies that it's less of a prediction and more of a humble request for help, meaning there's a chance the girls won't succeed. And to make the situation even more dire, for Sasha and Marcy to tap into the stones and use its power alongside Anne, they run the risk of depleting the stones for all their energy, meaning they may surrender their ticket home in the process of saving the world. The girls took on the challenge to save Amphibia, but Mother Own pulls Anne aside to let her know about a powerful spell that the stones hold, capable of destroying any foe, at the cost of the user's life setting the stage for one of the most emotionally charged moments I've seen in a Disney series. I love how when Anne joins up with Sasha and Marcy at the castle, Marcy's excited over the fact that Valeriana was waiting for them when they arrived, whereas Sasha just finds it kinda creepy. Intentional or not, it reminded me of how NPCs will just spawn in and wait for you in different areas of a video game. Which I like to think Marcy also recognized, hence her excitement over Valeriana's sudden appearance. As Valeriana restores Marcy and Sasha's powers, she tells everyone to think of their memories of Amphibia, as it'll allow the stones to resonate with their hearts once again. This confirms that the stones didn't just assign themselves to the trios by chance, but each stone attached to a particular girl, depending on a key trait. Now the Calamity Trio finally powering up and tapping into those cool anime powers together, seems to be influenced 
buy a few things. For starters, Sasha and Marcy's powers being restored through Anne is reminiscent of the infamous video game Sonic 06, where Super Sonic lends his power to Shadow and Silver so the three of them can fight together in a big space battle. I mean, also, he had the Chaos Emeralds, but like, I'm just saying what the game showed! Their armor is reminiscent of the anime Saint Seiya, and more so, Magic Knight Rayearth, which I actually haven't seen, both of which feature their own armor transformations, with the latter featuring lead characters with blue, red, and green color motifs, who are also middle schoolers. Of course, you could also draw parallels to Dragon Ball, with Super Saiyan Blue and Super Saiyan God. The way they fly out with colorful traits of aura behind them references the iconic Powerpuff Girls, with of course Blossom Bubbles and Buttercup sharing identical hues to the girls. And each of the Calamity forms have details unique to the three girls, such as the leaf crown, knee pads, and skirt on Anne, or the many spikes on Sasha. I also love how Anne has oval shapes in her gauntlets and chest plate, while Marcy has upside down triangles, and Sasha has diamonds. Anne's armor is also reminiscent of the final armor she was fitted for in Bessie and Michelangelo. That would be reduced to just the chest plate. Sasha unleashes a heron shaped burst of energy as a test run, conveying that the girls have a classic synergy buff. Their powers are amplified and stronger together than they are apart. I found it interesting that the core loaded up the moon with countless of insect like robots capable of mass destruction. Considering Andrea said the moon became home to numerous pet projects, I wonder if the goal wasn't just to turn the satellite into a middle finger against Amphibia itself, but a super weapon that could have been used for their invasions. There is just no chance to use the super weapon after the music box was stolen. The big battle between the girls and the core is spectacular. Not only is it accompanied with a loungy, guitar version of No Big Deal, similar to how 3D Sonic games have a tendency to use an arrangement of a respective game's theme for the final boss, but everyone also gets their own time to shine, and crafts an aura version of her iconic tennis racket, swinging a ball that splits off into multiple domino death beams, piercing through a fleet like it's nothing, the explosion forming the word ACE which is not only a nod to tennis, but a message often found in video games when nailing a combo or quick time event. Sasha summons pom-pom boxing gloves to fight with, calling back to her days as a cheerleader and queen bee, tearing through her enemies with hair and wings in her back in a sequence that's oh so satisfying, how she perfectly slugs out an eye from one robot, and then basically spin dashes through more of them in a zigzag pattern. She even has a mini boss fight. That's an S rank if I've ever seen one. Marcy's living her best anime life, summoning giant dice, and declaring she's happy to fight by her friend's side. A pretty cliche line for many anime and video games that put a smile on my face, brought a tear to my eye. As the dice cast, the backdrop of the hit she lands shows the cute little robot pin that she gave as a gift to Andreas, and the mascot of Vagabondia Chronicles. Marcy's favorite JRPG, as seen in the episode Marcy at the Gates. A robotic creature captures the dice, causing it to land on a nat 20 Money, baby, which in D&D yields an instant success. Originally in the storyboards, Marcy also shot an aura arrow after rolling the dice, and the Vagabondia characters appeared in a more direct way. The girls then come together and do a little zero gravity free fall in with their hands linked. Reminds me personally of the Kingdom Hearts 2.8 opening, where another trio, Terra, Aqua, and Ventus, are shown doing the same thing. So wholesome. Storyboard artist Drew Applegate stated, My main goal in drawing this scene was just to let the girls have fun together. They had all been through so much, and they were finally all together again and working to help one another. I just wanted to give them that moment in joy. Andreas is in awe as he watches the battle from a distance, and this dynamic shot was first teased in the core and the king during Leaf's vision, with Andreas, the moon, and the Calamity Trio removed for obvious spoiler reasons. Plus, they probably didn't even have animation back for this episode when finishing up that one, but the background art would have already been made. Aldrich begs Andreas for help in a desperate ploy to save the core. And originally, when Greg arrived on the scene, Andreas finally took notice of Beryl's Warhammer, but it was cut for time. However, I'd like to think this sight would have helped Andreas make up his mind as he decides to help the girls, commanding the remaining Frobots to help the trio, with all of them pushing back against the moon. This part of the final showdown is reminiscent of Sonic Adventure 2, something I've been calling for weeks now, as the girls giving their all to stop the moon serves as an homage to Sonic and Shadow trying to stop the Space Colony arc, something that concluded with Shadow sacrificing his life to save the world. 
sound a little familiar? I also love how we get one last hurrah with Marcy's clumsiness, trying to stop the robots before realizing they're on the same side as the girls, but tripping over a tiny little rock within the vastness of space, something she actually calls out in a cut line. Some things never change, even when you have the power of a god. As Andreas destroys his crown, and thus his connection to the core, his exchange with Aldrich is identical to Anne's exchange of Sasha in Reunion. What are you doing? Something I should have done a long time ago. Standing up to you! <gasps> what are you doing? Something I should have done a long time ago. Standing up to you! A very satisfying moment to see, and Phibia probably had the best approach to a villain redemption in an animated story since Zuko. Granted, Avatar was always putting up to a Zuko redemption, and he was never really considered the big bad. In another storyboard panel cut for time, Marcy did look back at Amphibia in this moment, relieved that Andreas chose to do the right thing. Another fun tidbit of trivia, originally the core had solar-powered backups on the moon to compete with the girls' power, but it ultimately made more sense to just have the thrusters work harder. Pinned against the ropes, Sasha and Marcy's power begins to fade, as it's the first time tapping into this transformation. Anne realizes she has no choice but to use the faded spell, sending her friends back to Amphibia's surface. Sprig panics when Marcy and Sasha relay Anne's intentions back to the planters, demanding Frobo to take him to Anne. The core refers to the stones as Amphibia's greatest treasure, causing Anne to retort with the sentiment that the stones aren't this world's greatest treasure. It's people are! With a super anime group shot of all the characters, not stopping at just the Wardwood civilians, but some side characters, such as Wally's father, the villagers of Little Frog Town, Priscilla and Pearl, who actually made a cameo at the end of All In as a part of the big army, so I technically got my wish to see Priscilla again, Bella the Bellhop, Apothecary Gary, and Percy and Braddock. Such a heartwarming moment. And wishes upon the stones to save the world she loves dearly, causing the stones to burst into pieces as she's imbued with their power turning her hair white as her body's glowing. Not only are white hair transformations pretty common in anime, but they often represent divinity, showing that Anne truly wields the power of a god. Her eyes become stars, something that may have been alluded to in True Colors, as they form a similar shape when Anne first transforms. Sprig pleads to Anne to not go through with the spell, but it's too late. This moment seriously wrecked my emotions, as Sprig calls Anne his everything. He wants to do anything in his power to protect his best friend, his sister, but he realizes there's nothing he can do. Anne's body begins to crack, something that was foreshadowed at the end of Ulm Town Road, with the prophecy depicting all three girls armored up and powered up. The cracks on this entrance lining up perfectly with the cracks formed on Anne, conjuring a mighty purple and blue blast that absolutely annihilates the core and the moon. Which I guess means Amphibia operates on Dragon Ball logic, as the moon was also destroyed in that series, without any radical consequence to the world around them. Speaking of Dragon Ball, the toll this attack takes on Anne's body leaves it in a near petrified state. A similar thing happens in the Boo arc of Dragon Ball Z, where an anti-hero, Vegeta, sacrifices his life and uses all of his power to self-destruct in an attempt to destroy Majin Buu leaving Vegeta's body in a petrified state before dropping to the ground and shattering into a million pieces. Good thing Anne had Sprig here. It's also reminiscent of the first Pokemon movie, where Ash is briefly petrified, leaving Pikachu and the audience shook. Everyone weeps as Anne says her parting words to Sprig, lamenting that she never got to see Love Choice too. Look, I'm not surprised Amphibia decided to seek some levity into this moment, but come on Anne, do better. Anne tragically passes on, as her body evaporates into leaves, calling to mind imagery that's at the end of Gurren Lagann, and how the Burnish pass away in the anime film Promare. But hey, wipe those tears, because it's time for our final fan spotlight. Or is it final? Hmm, honestly, I would love to keep showcasing fan art every now and then in content, opening it up to more than just Alhaus and Amphibia, but time will tell on that end. If you want to see more spotlights, just sound off in the comments below. But for now, hit it!
and wakes up in a plane that ascends the mortal realm in a location that's identical to the painting in her bedroom that appeared throughout season 3A. This was thought to just be a reference to Super Mario Galaxy, but it was also foreshadowing this entire time. The floating land Anne finds herself on is full of Easter eggs to the series. Two swords, Anne's tennis racket, the pot from Fight at the Museum, the planter household sign, Hop Hop's vegetable farm, a tennis ball on the weather vane of the house, and an autumn tree representing change. Inside the house, there are leaf patterns as the wallpaper, the lotus-shaped fireball from Anne's Season 3A shirt as a pattern on the curtains, the Domino 2 doll from the Domino Effect, Anne's missing shoe, the teapot she wanted to win for her mom in Hopping Mall, Sprig's Anne figure from Froggy Little Christmas, her sword and Hop Hop's cane in an umbrella stand, the lamp from the planter kitchen, the pen from Kane Crazy, Sprig's figures from Flood, Sweat, and Tears, framed portraits of Sasha, Marcy, the Boon Choys, Domino, no, Sprig, Hop Hop, and Polly. And lastly, the star ceiling, donut pillow, and cat plush from Anne's bedroom. The Three Stones deity initially takes the form of a computer, reminding me of the computer from Courage the Cowardly Dog, and the way they communicate in this form very much reminds me of Undertale. Specifically, the perplexed emoticon the deity uses reminds me of Napstabluk. The deity then decides to take the form of Domino, which means this was something foreshadowed in the episodes Adventures in Cat Sitting and Fight or Flight. She's the Alpha and Omega, an interdimensional being beyond all time and space. The Three Stones deity is voiced by none other than Charlene Yi, also known as the voice of Ruby on Steven Universe. And in this form, you can draw a lot of comparisons between the deity and QB from Madoka Magica. I talked about this in my ending explained for the finale, but the deity informs Anne that they made a copy of her before she passed on Earth, and that for all intents and purposes, she's still the same Anne Boonjoy. I describe this as a Gynax light ending. Gynax endings kind of becoming a trope within anime after multiple projects by Studio Gynax concluded their stories with WTF endings that either make no sense or absolutely blow your mind. Is our original Anne dead? Should this copy be regarded as a clone? It's up to your own interpretation, but personally, I choose to look at this as a new body for the same soul. I also love how we see the true form of the deity. Most shows tend to just stop at the my true appearance would warp your mind shtick. The deity reveals that the stones were created as a test for mortals to see if they could handle unlimited power. Anne was the only person to not abuse the stone's power, but to use them for good. And because of that, the deity wants to hand their job off to Anne. Of course, Anne passes on the job as she's only 13, has made plenty of mistakes, and feels as if she shouldn't be the one to have a final say on morality. People are always growing. Humanity is always trying to better itself. So one day, Anne may feel worthy of inheriting this post. The deity's perspective is changed thanks to Anne's words, and they give Anne another shot to complete her life by sending her back to Earth. This time, her shoe is notably on the other foot, so make of that what you will in relation to this Anne's identity. The deity also gave Anne a parting gift, three shards of calamity that is their ticket back home. The girls finally prepare to head back to Earth, for real, saying their goodbyes to their respective found families. Marcy apologizes to Union and Olivia for her selfish ways, wishing she got to connect with them more than she really did, while Union and Olivia inform Marcy that she helped them discover the love they shared between the two, finally confirming the two as a couple. Andreas can't even bear to look Marcy in the eyes as she says her farewell. He's very much ashamed of everything he's done to the poor kid, and is shocked that she even acknowledged him on her way out. Makes me wish they kept in that storyboard of her looking back on Amphibia, knowing he was helping out. I think it adds a little bit more weight to this scene. Sasha and Grime try to have a professional, emotionless farewell, but get too choked up and bawl their eyes out. These two are my absolute favorite animated duo in quite some time. Sasha tells Grime to find Percy and Braddock, informing them that she'll miss those two forever. I appreciate that Percy and Braddock never appeared again after Beryl's Warhammer, as although it's sad, it made the consequences to Sasha's actions feel real. As Anne has the most emotionally charged goodbye with the planters, there's a musical callback to Best Franz and the scene where Anne tucks in Sprig. She gives Sprig her phone as a memento, which is something I want to dive into at a later time. The girls take a bow in front of the final portal, but not before we get one more dose of Sprig and Anne. The ultimate friendship. 
Kudos to the talented animator behind this wonderful rotating shot of the two embracing for one last time. It definitely got everyone I was watching with at least a little teary-eyed. After the girls return to Earth, the music box crumbles away in Valeriana's hands, an action that really caused it to sink in that the series is ending. Watching what was basically the mascot of the series be reduced to ashes in the wind. An unspecified time skip occurs, about nine months according to Matt on Twitter, as Amphibia recovers from Andreas's industrialization. The robot factory is presumably kept around, as they can create robots who help the environment instead of harming it, such as the one helping Andreas farm the land. Andreas, alongside the Triple B bros, seem to be serving a prison sentence for their war crimes as they're all chained up. Remember, Triple B helped Andreas create new robots as seen in Froggy Little Christmas. But despite this prison sentence, I think Andreas feels more free than he ever has in his life. Atoning for his actions and symbolically reconciling with Leaf by taking up her old duties as a gardener. He's also wearing Leaf's leaf, Marcy's pin, and carrying around Beryl's warhammer. No longer trying to forget his loved ones, but instead spend whatever time he has left honoring their memory. Matt went on to confirm on Twitter that Andreas is indeed going blind. He refused any cybernetic implants and will spend the remainder of his days truly giving back to Amphibia. The frog being carried around by a giant dragonfly throughout the series now sports a long beard and evidently loves this terrifying life he lives. Wally bumps into an aged up Polly, now fully frog, calling back to the beginning of the very first episode. Lago lost all his gains, Apothecary Gary can be seen chilling with another mushroom, as set up in the root of all evil, while Grime, Noonan, and Olivia are now delegates of the newly formed Amphibia government. Grime can also be spotted with Sasha's silver heron blade, the one he gave her as a gift in true colors. Toadie's now mayor, Hop Hop's growing avocados after his affinity for them was introduced in Escape to Amphibia, and Sprick has transformed Anne's old room into a study, and is now documenting all of Amphibia's wildlife in a journal. His bulletin board has a few more easter eggs, such as Anne's Big Bird form from Cursed, lyrics from the song Welcome to Amphibia, a lyrical version of the theme that Matt wasn't a huge fan of, Domino 2 in both forms, the landscape of Amphibia, the piranha plant looking tomato plant from Season 1's Hop Luck, the Amphibia alphabet slowly being decoded to the English alphabet, another map of Amphibia, the grub hog, a leaf, likely the one that was left behind when Anne went through the portal, and finally, the tie to go menu. The townsfolk unveil a new statue of Anne, hailing her as Amphibia's savior. Of course, her theme is playing in the background as well. Ivy rushes in, claiming that her mom found a new continent untouched by any amphibian, leaving the door open for a potential spinoff down the road, but we'll unpack that at another time. The time skip continues 10 years into the future, back on Earth at LAX, as Marcy texts Sasha that she's at the gate, a nod towards Marcy's debut in the episode Marcy at the Gates. Marcy has keychains of Bakugo from My Hero Academia, Sakura from Naruto, and Shuntaro from Demon Slayer. Telling me you haven't gotten into any new anime in 10 years, Marcy? I don't know. The news report on TV states that it's been about a decade since Frogvasion, but apparently some people believe it was a hoax. Don't know how that checks out, given all the eyewitnesses but at least that gave an excuse for Anne, Sasha, and Marcy to go on and live normal lives. Sasha wears a jacket with a patch of her hair and blades, and in her car, she has a sticker of a bisexual colored heart, her guitar from Battle of the Bands, and a keychain replica of her hair and blades. Marcy has one more clumsy trip when reuniting with Sasha, and we learn that she's in town for Anne's birthday. Marcy now has a webcomic, and Sasha's actually read some of it, showing that she's taken an interest in Marcy's passions. And Sasha went on to become a children's therapist, helping them work through their anger issues as she once had. Now, how Sasha talks about her and Anne's friendship after Marcy moved away may leave people feeling as if they stopped being good friends entirely and that Marcy never visited, but Matt Brawley clarified on Twitter that Marcy did visit many times. The dialogue was left open, but her comment about 10 years having passed was in reference to the anniversary of their adventure, not the last time they've been together. Matt suggested the specifics of Anne and Sasha's behavior post Marcy moved moving away, was always something Marcy was very curious about, but never wanted to pry by asking directly. 
After 10 years, enough time had passed where Marcy just needed to know and decided to speak up. But he doesn't want to say too much more as he wants things to be left to the viewer's interpretation. And now runs a frog exhibit at an aquarium, which is of course a nod to the episode A Day at the Aquarium where she had a hard time saying goodbye to the planters. The exhibit is called Amphibia, with many nods to the world she once knew. Not only did she name a pink frog after Sprig, but she has recreations of the planter household, Newtopia, Toad Tower, and Proteus. There's also a toad that looks just like Grime. As the trio reunites once more and embraces, the framing of the shot is made to resemble the illustration and gems on the Calamity Box, bringing things full circle as the story of Amphibia comes to a close. The extended credits has some neat details as well, showing the temporary homes for the girls as we see the Ant statue in Wartwood, the current state of Newtopia, with the girls' signature weapons lodged into the edge of a cliff, reminding everyone of their heroes, Toe Tower, with flowers blooming on the overgrowth, which I believe conveys a new chapter for the toads and their change of heart, and finally, the planter family household at night, adjusting to change in a world without Anne. These credits also list every single overseas animator that helped bring this episode to life, a rare practice animation that the crew fought hard to keep in the final product here. And there's a special thanks that shouts out many notable names, such as Alex Hirsch, creator of Gravity Falls, which Matt Brawley worked on, Dana Terrace, creator of The Owl House, Matt's parents, on and Bruce Brawley, Domino, Matt's cat who inspired Amphibious Domino and Domino 2, Michael Ryanda, director of the Mitchells vs. the Machines and Gravity Falls alumni, and Thrup Van Orman, creator of Flapjack. He also voiced the original Sprig, Weed, in the Amphibia pilot. And I said, I am weed. Finally, the last shot of the series features a recreation of the BFF photo, now with the girls at age 23, all holding hands. This photograph is surrounded by drinks that matches each of the girls' respective colors. Tide text appears on the bottom corner of the screen, which reads, The End or Complete. And with that, it's over. Amphibia has come to a beautiful close. And I want to thank you guys so, 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 so much for watching all of our Amphibia content over the years. As you guys as may know, this show has gotten me through the lowest of lows with its highest of highs. And although I'm not really sad to see it end, because Matt Brawley got to get out there and tell the story he wanted to tell, I will miss this. But just like how Anne, Sasha, and Marcy moved on to new things, just like how everyone in Amphibia moved on to new things, I'm excited to reinvent my content and keep the fun times going in a brand new way. And I really hope you guys will stick around for that ride. But for now, please drop your thoughts on the Amphibia series finale in the comments below, and keep the conversation going by giving us a follow at AustricVox and at RoundtableVids on Twitter and Instagram. Be sure to check out Toon Drip, and if you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an amazing day, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Adios!